the diligent is sailing in the year 1731 and 32, which is right at the period when the international trade had been conducted by chartered companies that had m monopolies on the trade from a certain country. So the, the French Company of the Indies had a monopoly on the French trade. The British uh, Royal African Company had a monopoly on the, Af on the British trade and, and, and so on. But right around 1730, these monopolies were breaking up and you're getting private enterprise trade coming in. So you have a movement from mercantilism to capitalism going on right at the time. And the Diligent was not a ship owned by a large monopoly company. It was a ship owned by two brothers, uh, the Billy brothers, William Billy and Francois Billy. And so it was one of the first examples of a private enterprise trade uh, breaking into a trade that had formerly been uh, controlled by monopoly companies. Uh, and so, in a sense that it was private enterprise, then you are having the rise of capitalism, uh, private enterprise capitalism going on. And that's the point at which the slave trade then uh, starts to really expand. Uh, because the monopoly companies had um, they were very rigid and had cumbersome bureaucratic structures and so on. And once the private enterprise traders started getting in, they would go to other places where the companies didn't go, and they had a lot more flexibility and so on. And you had a huge expansion of the slave trade then once the, the private enterprise traders entered into the, the business. Each nation, they, it would be chartered monopoly companies. The, the government would give a charter to a certain company and say, you have a monopoly uh, over, the over the British slave trade, you have a monopoly over the French slave trade, you have a monopoly over the Dutch slave trade. And so up, right, so up until about the 1730s, it was these monopoly companies that were uh, sponsored by their governments. And then it was only after 1730, the, the power of the monopoly companies declines drastically and it becomes more of a, a, you know, free-for-all uh, private enterprise. Well, in the early 1400s, around 1445, uh, Prince Henry the Navigator who of, in Portugal was sending out ships to explore the coast of Africa and he wanted them to bring back things to pay their way. He wanted them to bring back gold, but they weren't having much luck finding gold. So he said, well, bring back something so that you know we're not wasting our money sending you out. So the early ships would attack, especially small islands where there would be Africans living, you know, by fishing mostly, and they weren't expecting to be attacked, and they'd be attacked and grabbed and hauled to Portugal. But about ten years after that started happening, the Africans started realizing that uh, these ships coming were hostile, and they got ready to defend themselves. And the Portuguese started getting defeated a lot. And some Portuguese crews would be destroyed and the Africans were defending themselves very well. So uh, then the king sent somebody down to spend a year visiting all the local African kings and chiefs and convincing them to engage in trade and not uh, in warfare. And so that was the beginning of what was the pattern then for the next 400 years that slave ships would go to Africa and they would purchase slaves. They wouldn't try to go into the African continent and conduct raids because well, they were out, they were vastly outnumbered. The Africans knew the terrain, they didn't. Uh, and plus the crews of most ships, you know, these were sailors, these were not US Marines, they were not SEAL Team 6. They didn't really know how to launch a raid on a village anyway. So. Uh, for the next 400 years, the slave trade then was really conducted by trade. The ships would be filled with uh, African uh, with goods that Africans wanted to buy, a lot of cloth, uh, metal goods, other things. And then uh, these goods would be taken to Africa and traded usually for war prisoners because various African kingdoms were often at war with one another. In the days of the Romans and the Greeks, I mean, certainly, for example, when Julius Caesar invaded southern France, which was called Gaul, he was there for eight years and came back with a million slaves. That is, 
people from southern France that he had enslaved and brought back to Rome. And the, the Greek city-states, you learned about the, the wars between Athens and Sparta. And again, they would capture slaves from each other. So basically, in sort of old world Mediterranean slavery, the slaves often came from nearby because they'd been captured in wars. And within Africa, too, when two kingdoms would have a war, prisoners of war would often be taken from one kingdom to another. And then the question is, what did they do with them? And then when the Europeans showed up and said, well, we'll buy them, well, then some of these kings said, well, you know, thought that was a pretty good deal. So then they cooperated and started selling their prisoners of war to the Europeans. What time frame is that you're talking about? I'm talking about after especially mostly after 1500. But what made this slavery different, yes, was people are being hauled halfway around the world, which is something that had never, in world history, had never happened before. Yeah, I mean, Africa, from early on, had always had a series of kingdoms, and sometimes, you know, small kingdoms become large kingdoms, and they do that by conquering their neighbors. Uh, and certainly, the diligent arrives on the coast of what was then called the Kingdom of Dahomey in 1732. And the Kingdom of Dahomey had been a relatively small kingdom, but over the previous 10 years, it had been fighting a series of wars and expanding and expanding. And it continued to expand until about 1750. And uh, the prisoners of those wars then were often sold to the Europeans, usually in exchange for guns and gunpowder. Because King Agaja of Dahomey had started out with an army that used bows and arrows, and he quickly replaced it with an army that used nothing but guns. And so once he had an army that was reliant on guns, he had a need, especially for continual supplies of gunpowder. He doesn't always need new guns, but he always needs new powder, especially in the tropical areas where it's very humid and powder goes bad very quickly. And at one time, he wrote a letter to King George of England, and he said, you know, my big need is a continuous supply of, of gunpowder. Uh, and so he was uh, using his slave trade connections to create a big, powerful kingdom. And prior to the arrival of the diligent, it, there was this tiny little kingdom of Weda. And uh, the kingdom of Weda was a tiny little kingdom. I mean, it was like 20 miles of coastline and 20 miles inland. That was it. But yet, in the first quarter of the 1700s, uh, about 46% of all slaves coming out of Africa were coming from that one spot. Now, why? The answer is the kings of Weda did not send out armies and capture slaves. They just, they just controlled the ports. And this was an area where there was dense rainforest to the east and dense rainforest to the west. But here was a spot where there was grassland that came all the way down to the coast. So any kings far inland who captured captives in wars and wanted to sell them to the Europeans would send them to that spot because they didn't have to trudge through dense forest and they could get to the coast. And there are reports of people arriving there who'd been on the, the road for over three months and uh, coming from kingdoms up near the desert where the people are Muslim and the people in Muslim robes. In the uh, interior of uh, Africa, close to, on the road to Timbuktu. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and people, the merchants wearing Muslim robes, that means coming from quite far away. And so the kings of Weda, all they did is tax the trade and, and take a percentage of it. And so they were getting rich, uh, even though they didn't have much of an army and they didn't attack anybody. And they were just happened to be in the good spot uh, for profiting from the trade. And then the king of Dahomey, who was farther inland, and was cut off from the coast by the kingdom of Weda, went, destroyed them so he would have access to the coast. And then he then used his access to then develop his army and, and expand his kingdom. So you had the merchant kingdom being destroyed and replaced by the militarized kingdom, if you put it that way. Obviously, there had been kingdoms before that had had armies. And, and I mean, there's a long history of, of various kingdoms in Africa. But the new thing here was that they could get ready supplies of guns from the Europeans. And the same way uh, to the uh, west of Dahomey, along the 
the interior of the Gold Coast, a kingdom called the Asante Empire started rising around 1700. And Asante too kept expanding and expanding and expanding and they would take their prisoners of war and sell them to the Europeans uh, in return for guns and gunpowder. So you have a whole new dynamic of, uh, of kingdom building and kingdom expansion after the European slave traders arrive than what you had before. The, uh, the scale expanded greatly. I mean, the companies had been bringing in guns and, and things as well previously, but not on as great a scale because, again, they were more limited in their, their actions because they were basically cumbersome bureaucracies that were... Did they feel bad that they were sending these slaves into a, a tortured, horrific life working in sugarcane factories in the Caribbean, or they didn't know about it? Well, they didn't know where they were going, but though I suspect they didn't care because the slaves were always, they were never selling their own people. They were selling their enemies. And even uh, during the period of the slave trade, like when the diligent was dealing with King Agaja, some of the slaves that were captured the best ones would often be kept to work on King Agaja's fields and farms out around his palace, and then the rest would be sold. So there were always, a th it was always a system where some of the captives, cap people captured in war would be sold to the Europeans and some would be uh, kept inside of Africa. But and it turned out that the ones that were kept inside of Africa were the lucky ones, and uh, the ones that got put on the slave ships were the unlucky ones. Most people learned about slavery uh, in U.S. history courses in high school. And so most people think that s the slave trade was all about people taken from Africa and brought to the United States. And while that was terribly important in the history of the United States, the fact is that of all the, s the slaves who were carried across the Atlantic during the 400 years between 1450 and 1850, only about 4 percent of them came to the United States. Only the rest of them went to the Caribbean and South America, mainly Brazil. Brazil was settled by the Portuguese, it was a Portuguese colony. So uh, the slaves that came to Brazil were all carried on Portuguese ships. And uh, they were mostly put to work growing sugar. And sugar was the main thing that drove the slave trade in Brazil. It was the main thing that drove the slave trade in the Caribbean. Uh, it was sugar plantations. And the thing about sugar plantations, it partly is, they're in tropical areas where you can have a whole series of uh, harvests throughout the year. So that slavery in a sugar producing place was much more harsh than slavery in a place where there's only one harvest season or one planting season per year. And there were huge uh, mortality rates uh, among slaves and uh, and so on in places like the Caribbean. In the 1500s, there was an agreement between Spain and Portugal in which they divided up the world as they were exploring <laughs> of who could trade where. And the Portuguese got the right to trade in Africa and Brazil, and the Spanish did not have the right to trade in Africa. So. That's why you never, you didn't have Spanish ships going to Africa and participating in the slave trade. Right. So they would always contract out for this, for like for Mexico, for Argentina, other parts of Latin America that were Spanish colonies and were not Portuguese colonies. They would contract it out and the contract was called the Asiento. And for about a hundred years, yeah, the Portuguese, all this carried, whatever slaves came into the Spanish colonies of South America uh, were carried by the Portuguese. Then the Asiento contract was held for a while by the Dutch, and then it was held for a while by the French, and then it was held by, for a while by the English. And so, and so different people ha held it, but it was always other countries that were uh, taking slaves to the Spanish colonies of the New World and, and not Spanish ships because of that uh, treaty that was created in the 1500s. But the reason slaves were branded is because on a slave ship, most of the slaves were purchased on behalf of the owners of the ship. But some of the slaves were purchased especially by the officers themselves.
And the reason the officers would go on slaving voyages is because they could make 10 times as much money from purchasing slaves and reselling them in the New World as they could make from their salaries. So they were trying, they used it to make a distinction between uh, the slaves who were purchased by, on behalf of the owners of the ship and those who were purchased by the crew members. And the reason for the court trial is that on the Middle Passage, that's the passage from Africa to the New World, uh, one of the slaves belonging to the captain died, and the captain reported it as a slave belonging to the owners. And, uh, and, so, and so what happened there? You, so he, he kind of lied, right? Oh, he, he totally lied. And that was a very common practice because there was a saying in those days that the captain's slaves never die, meaning if they die, they don't, they, they don't get recorded as belonging to the captain. And, but in this case, uh, the captain wanted all of the officers, they all had to sign a death certificate swearing you know, who it belonged to. And the officers refused and it ended up in the court. It was a set of laws governing slavery in the French colonies. And Code Noir is French, it means black, the black code or black laws. And the, um, the rule was that after a slave arrived in the colonies, they had to be baptized within seven days and then they would be given a Christian name. So even then, nobody was interested in what their African names were. Uh, did the English do that also in the in, Dutch? No, they, they had no laws like that. Yeah, so. I mean, the Code Noir came out of the fact that in the earliest days uh, prior to uh, in the late, uh, late 1600s, early 1700s, uh, the biggest slave holding holders in some of the Caribbean colonies like Martinique and others were actually the Jesuits. And so the Jesuits felt obligated, since they were the biggest slaveholders, to say, well, we have slaves, but we're doing it by the book. And so then they wrote the laws, and, uh, and then the king made the decree. Uh, but that's where that came from. But in the British colonies and Dutch colonies and other colonies, there wasn't any such religious involvement from the early days, so there was no similar set of, of rules governing slavery. First Lieutenant Robert Durand opens his journal. He says, with the help of God, we are attempting to go from France uh, to the coast of Guinea uh, and then to the Caribbean to sell our blacks and make our return to Vaughan. So he's showing that he has no embarrassment, no feeling of shame, no feeling of guilt about what he's doing because otherwise he wouldn't have dedicated the, the voyage. Uh, well, he dedicates it to God and the Virgin Mary, in fact, uh, with the help. Uh, oh, it starts out to the greater glory of God and the Virgin Mary. With the help of God, we're attempting to go to Vaughan. So clearly he had somehow convinced himself that what he was doing was somehow okay and they didn't allow anybody who was not Christian to handle those slaves, isn't that correct? The French. Yeah, often, I mean, there's a case later in the Congo, which is another country farther down in Africa, where the Congo king was selling some slaves to the English, uh, and the French came over and said, you can't sell slaves to the English because uh, they're, not, they're not good Catholics, you have to sell them to us. And so religion actually became a, a factor in the bargaining of who could sell slaves to whom. Well, they cite slavery in the Bible as a justification as well. And they cite the fact that they said, well, once they've been baptized, then they'll go to heaven, so we've given them eternal life. So if they're going to be slaves for a few years, you know, that's, that's a small price to pay for you know, eternity in heaven. And that's the argument they used, and they. It's very but, horrific, all this slavery thing, and you. Well, well, yeah, because I mean, if that argument had, was justifiable, then why didn't they send French people to be slaves, and then they'd go to heaven? So it, it didn't make any sense, but that's what they did.
that's a diagram of uh, slaves put on the slave deck of a slave ship. And uh, you can see how they're packed together so close that there's barely room to breathe. And uh, it's an image of a specific ship called the Vigilant. And there it is. Now it's at the right proportions. But uh, somebody did a drawing of that just to show how <coughs> difficult it was to be a slave in a slave ship. Okay, the people on the edges are lying down under the platforms because there's a, the slave deck is only about four feet high. And there's a platform then that divides it sort of in half, two feet and two feet. And so around the edges, the slaves are lying down under the platform and then there'll be another group lying on top of the platform. In the middle, they're, they're sitting. They're sitting with, you can see, with their, their knees up against their chests. Now, no, so this is looking inside of a typical slave ship, really, and the men were chained together and the women were not. And how were the men chained together? Well, they were often, usually two by two. Uh, uh, from the leg of right leg of one to the left leg of another, but and I'll show you later. There were chains is one thing, but they also had slave irons, which were worse because they were much more ri rigid and much more uncomfortable. Uh, and, and and what is that shot that that, that we're looking at there? Well, th this shows the platforms. This is a, a cross section shot, and you see on the left and the right, one person lying under the platform and then one person lying over it on top of it. And then in the middle there, you have the people seated, uh, grunts up, and that was the way to pack the absolute maximum number of people. Now, what happened with, on the Diligent and a lot of ships is because the, the, they wanted the slaves to be healthy enough to sell for a, a reasonable price at the other side. So they would bring them up during the day uh, in groups at a time, and then they would often play music and have them dance for exercise. I mean, like exercise in the prison. So you know, they would have the slaves come up once a day. You know, when I was looking at the diligent and looking through the crew list, I saw this one guy, and in French it said his name, and then it said Musette. Well, Musette is the French word for accordion. And I thought, what? What's going on? So I, the dancing was not joyful. It was, as I say, like exercise in a prison yard. And here are, the, here are some of the chains that you're talking These about. These are that. the slave irons, yeah that would then hold the, the left foot of one person to the right foot of another. And you see it's highly rigid and extremely uncomfortable. So people who were in chains were actually slightly better off than the people who were in slave irons. Which, and on French slave ships, the slave irons were the dominant uh, way of fastening people. This is the palace of, uh, of the, the King of Ouida. You see there that the French, a company of the Indies, the, the British Royal African Company, the Dutch uh, West India Company and the Portuguese uh, Company all had their headquarters right inside the palace of the king. And it shows how the tight relationship they had with the king, because the king was making a lot of profit from the slave trade. And uh, so he you know, made sure to keep good relationships with the, the big companies. So they were right there. Well, let's take a look at his palace, when, and let's take him out of the shot for a moment and take a look at this palace. And talk to us what, what you see here. Oh, this is the coronation of a new king. This is King Hafan being uh, uh, enthroned in, uh, in 1725, and this is the official coronation ceremony. And you see along the left side, you see all of these uh, Europeans sitting there, and th they're all guests of honor uh, at the, the, the king's uh, coronation. And again, you see how the, the, the big companies in Europe and the king of, uh, of Ouida then were working together for mutual profit, and the people who paid the price were the, the slaves themselves. Top here. The Gold Coast was a place where inland there were gold mines. And during the 1600s, a whole series of forts and castles got built along the Gold Coast, basically for the gold trade in the 1600s. But then as the 1700s came up, the gold trade started to diminish. And in the meantime, in the hinterland of the coast, a new empire was arising, the Asante Empire. And as they expanded, they captured prisoners who they sold for guns. And then all of those forts that had originally been built for the gold trade now became slave forts. Well, what they would do is when a ship would come, they would unload all the trade goods into the fort. And then the people in the fort 
would then, you know, trade those over time for slaves. And then so when a ship would come, they could turn around really fast. They unload all the goods, they pick up whatever slaves are in the fort, turn around and go back. And so, it, and it was the companies that owned those forts and that was part of the whole company system. And the purpose of the forts was to have a bunch of slaves ready to go when a ship came and, and put them in. The problem for the companies was that the upkeep of those forts was very, very expensive. And like the British forts by 1710 could no longer afford their own upkeep and they had to ask for a subsidy from the British government. Uh, just to keep up the forts. And, and it's again, that's part of the burden on the big companies, whereas the independent private traders could just go anywhere they wanted. Whereas the companies were sort of stuck with trading in their own forts. So that's part of, again, the cumbersome bureaucracy of the big monopoly companies versus the sort of nimbleness of the private trader. The reason why France and Britain were very different from America in America, they saw slave ships, they saw slaves coming out, they saw them put to work. In France, the ship left filled with cloth and other goods. It came back, it went to Africa, bought the slaves, went to the Caribbean, sold them, and it came back with sugar. So all the people in France saw was the ship left with cloth, came back with sugar. Now from time to time, captains then would bring a few slaves with them to France, but these would often be domestic servants who would often be quite well dressed and often quite polished in their manners. So, and in Britain the same way. In uh, uh, 1772, the Somerset case said also slaves that came to Britain were free. So for Britain and France, they did all of their slavery in the, in the New World and didn't see it where they were.